So thank you everybody for being here today. I think this whole thing started probably 12 years ago with my involvement in functional medicine, with putting biology against what happens in medicine, trying to see which side does what. And it's been a really interesting journey. It's been an exciting journey and it forms part and parcel of my day in my practice today. So turbo cancers after COVID is a specific topic. So we've got three main, you could say, sections. The first one is what is cancer? What do we know about cancer today? How does it start and how does it work in the body? Second part is how is it linked to COVID-19? In other words, why would it happen now and not before so much? The third one is what can we do about it? So that's the light of the, at the end of the tunnel. There is a lot of stuff we can do. And I think it's exciting for me to share. It's not what I've thought of. So my, my function here is really just to take what's available, to sit for hours and hours, compile and put it together in a, in a you could say in a, in a fashion that is useful to the end user, which are normally the cancer affected, or if you want to call it like that, the cancer patients. So at the end of the day, then we can say, what are we, each one of us, going to do about it? Um, many of the things are complicated and involved. I've put them in here basically just to show you that there is lots of reason to be optimistic, that there is lots of reasons to actually improve and do what we are going to suggest here. You are free to record everything. Um, these lectures will be available online eventually. I will cut them in a certain shape, probably in three sections, and then make them available. This is a disclaimer. As always, this is not medical advice. It's not medical treatment. This is a supportive program and the information that you get here. You could have actually collected yourself so we've just gone and made it easier for you to have it here. So people that are involved in cancer treatments, the main group treating you is your doctor and your oncologist. So I don't want to get involved in that one. I don't want to have a fight with them. I don't want to convince anybody. It's free for everybody to do what they do to get the information that they need. Where are we with cancer today? Let's jump back. And this is in 2019, I think, these data. Um, and then up to 21, 2021. If you look at these worldwide statistics, they're pretty horrendous. We've got on top, we've got cardiovascular disease. And then second, we've got cancers already. So that's quite a, quite a hefty burden that we have. We call it the, the chronic disease burden. At the most basic, if we go to the institutions that have the information and provide us with information, they all go back to one thing, and they say cancer is a genetic disease. Now, what you will see in the next hour or so will actually maybe give you additional information. It's not that simple. Genetic changes are the end result of what we see in the cancers. This is also from the Institute of Cancer. Um, and you can see once again, the focus is on genetics. And I don't think today we can stay there. We have to move on and, and go a bit deeper. The genetic theory has been called the somation, uh, somatic mutations theory. In other words, somatic meaning body cells get mutations Okay, so cancer cells grow like crazy. They have blood vessels going in. They don't talk to each other anymore, and they, they do not die. Apoptosis means a cell basically packs up and dies. They really cannot, um, they cannot die. They, they carry on and on. There are some cell lines, cancer cell lines in research that have been used for over 60 years, and they still grow. So cancer cells don't grow, and eventually they spread to the rest of the body. Then in 2011, it was found that they actually suppress the immune system, and they create extra inflammation because they love inflammation, and they live in an environment of inflammation. And then in the end, they found, yes, there is genetic instability, which is really mutations. 
And the last thing that I've highlighted here in yellow is to me one of the most crucial ones. There are always changes in their fuel system, the way they use fuel. So if it's a genetic disease, why do small children get cancer? Genetics would mean that over lifetime, you smoke, you do all things that, that cause uh, mutations. They would be more when you're old, and we know that, and that happens. But then a child should be pretty safe, and it shouldn't really have any problems. And we, don't, we, we know that it's not the case. In fact, today, there are quite a few child cancers in very, very young children, and <clears throat> that is not explained by genetic mutations. Why, are every, why is every cell different? If you had, a, say, a breast tumor, you would, understand, you would think that you take one tumor out and you look at individual cells, they would all be the same because they come from one cell that has had a mutation. That's not the case. Every single cell is different. So in one cancer block, you've got millions and millions of different cancer cells genetically. So how does that work? And why, after so many years of spending a huge amount of money, it's a huge industry. We still don't get to a point where we predictably can help people. The last one, and this is really the topic that fits in today's um, session, is why do we see so many aggressive cancers in youngish people after this COVID time? The last four years have not just COVID, but all sorts of chronic disease. So if we look at cancer, it's really the tip of the iceberg. It's a disease that builds over time, over many, many years in your body. And ultimately, you get the diagnosis. And then you sit with what the doctor will call, you've got a tumor or a cancerous growth. And it's cool to go and then address the symptoms and try and change something there. But at the bottom, we have to look at why it, does, why it happens and where it comes from. So in 2014, I became aware, and that's like 10 years ago, of a person called Dr. Thomas Seyfri. He's at Boston College, and, you know, he's been there since, you know, 40 years or sort of 40 plus years. His whole life was in research. He's not a medical doctor. He's a researcher, and you've got his background there on the slide. By the way, if you want to spend time, you just pause the video and you can look at these slides in peace and quiet. And as you see at the bottom, he's well published, as they say. His life has been in cancer research <clears throat> and he pulled up something that was very, very different. And that is that cancer is a metabolic disease. Now that's his model. And he says it starts with mitochondria that are damaged. Now, many of you might not know what mitochondria is. We're going to explain and talk about it at length. At the end of damaged mitochondria, you will have cells moving into cancer growth. So it's not just mutation happening by itself. There is a long process that has to be gone through, that, that every body goes through to have cancer cells in the end. When it starts, we don't know, but it often is influenced massively by lifestyle, by our modern environment. So let's move to mitochondria. Mitochondria, on the left, we've got a cell. And in the cell, so those of you who have had biology at school um, will remember there are many little organelles, as we call them. There's this purple thing, which is our cell nucleus, which contains our DNA, our genetic material. And then we've got the Golgi body, endoplasmic reticulum. And then we've got these little goodies with a funny little shape called mitochondria. Where do we get them from? They are in the ovum of our mother. And the ovum carries on growing. And we call it mitochondrial DNA from the mother. That carries on. The father also has mitochondrial DNA, but it's in the tail of the sperm. And the moment that sperm comes to the outside of the egg and it burrows its way through that outer membrane, the tail is left behind. So we don't have paternal father DNA. So our DNA for the mitochondria comes through the mother, from the mother. And that's a crucial um, fact because if the mother is not healthy and her mitochondria are not doing well, there's a good chance that those will be passed on to the offspring. All right, 
So where do we find the most mitochondria? Number one, in the brain. Why? Because the brain uses a huge amount of energy. And as we will see, the energy is important in all these issues. So the heart is the second most energy dependent organ. Our immune system, when we are healthy and flourishing, our immune system uses about 10% of our energy. When we are sick, switch over. We switch down the brain, we switch down the digestive system, we don't move anymore, we lie down and we heal. And then 40% of our total energy is taken up by our immune system, it's shifted to our immune system. And all that energy is created by the mitochondria. In fact, you, you basically create your own weight, body weight, per day in ATP, which is a molecule produced by the mitochondria, which is like petrol for the car engine. Okay, here are some statistics. We've got 30 to some say 70 trillion cells. We've got 110 trillion mitochondria. Now that's 110 million million mitochondria. And they make up 10% of our body weight. Now, obviously, these are guesstimates, but they give us an idea of what's happening. Most body cells have got a couple of thousand, and then the heart cells, the cardiocytes, have up to 8,000. The neurocytes, which is our brain, have got up to 2 million. So if there's anything that damages your mitochondria, you can understand that your heart's not doing well, and your brain especially. Brain fog, depression, anxiety attacks are all signs that your mitochondria have been damaged and that your brain can't function anymore. They've got DNA, which is nucleic acid, uh, which is genetic material, and mitochondrial DNA only has 24 genes. And you see there at the bottom, the other 1,000 genes come from the cell. Now, how does it work? The cell gives some and the mitochondria gives some. Mitochondria are ancient bacteria. The theory is that 2.5 billion years ago, the one bacteria went into a single cell organism. So they formed a partnership. And that was the time when the Earth changed from about 2% oxygen to 20% oxygen. Why, why was it sensible? The single cell couldn't live in that in 20% oxygen because oxygen, if you don't know what to do with it, it's toxic for you. It's an oxidative molecule. It, it, it nails you, it rusts you. So the mitochondria came along and said, listen, I can work with oxygen and I use fuel and oxygen and make energy for you and you protect me. And this is where it all started. So the mitochondria and the cell work together. The cell gives 1,000 proteins and the mitochondria or, or 1,000 in the mitochondria have got only 24 genes. So actually their own structure is built, built mainly by the cell and a little bit by themselves. This is a genetic uh, little loop, a DNA loop, and it's important to realize that mitochondrial DNA has got little loops. It's not long strings. It looks like a donut. Wreath and donut. Okay, and these are the genes. There are a thousand genes that come from the cell at the left here, and there's only 20, uh, 14 genes for protein. So a thousand genes from the cell and 14. Please remember when you build mitochondria, these parts have to be, you could say, produced and then they have to be assembled. I always compare it it's to an Airbus. The Airbus is an aeroplane built in Germany. There are parts that come from Belgium, there are parts that come from Germany, and there are parts that come from France, and they are all assembled in Toulouse in France. So it's the same here. You build components in different areas, and then eventually you put them together in the, to form mitochondria. So what do mitochondria do? They have a healthy oxidative phosphorylation. So putting it in simple terms, they take oxygen and they take glucose and other fermentable fuels and they burn it up and they create energy just like a car engine. They need healthy DNA. There is an electric potential over the membrane and that has to be 70 to 150 to 170 millivolts. And the other stuff is actually 
not so important for now, but let's put it mildly, they have to work properly, otherwise you're in trouble. Mitochondria can grow more. In other words, they grow bigger and bigger, and also they restructure themselves. You can see at the top here, this mitochondria has taken all the bad parts, you know, these little black strings and shifted into one corner. And then it splits and it throws out. It's like somebody putting air, all their junk in a rubbish bag and chucking it out beyond, into the yard. So in the healthy mitochondria carry on and they regrow. And when problem starts, the problem gets shifted. So it's a self-cleansing process and it's aided by mitophagy. And we'll talk about that later. So remember, they can clean themselves. They throw out the bad things and the bad parts of themselves, and then they can grow new ones. And that's part and parcel of therapy today. So this is a heart muscle. The little dark goodies are all mitochondria. You can see them here. There are many, 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 because the heart uses a lot of energy in its daily activities. This is an electron microscope of these membranes. Now, on the graphic, they look like little rubber, um, rubber balls that have been put into a, a knot. But in real life, they've got these long called cristae. And that is to create a bigger surface. Because something is folded up, like our intestines, it makes a bigger surface. So the electron transfer chain is the electronic, biomechanical, biometabolistic system that acts in these membranes. Now, this is the inside of the mitochondrial. It's called a matrix. And that is the intermembrane space. So there are a couple of big molecules, complex one, two, three, four, and five. And from the inside, where energy is produced, the energy gets used to pump protons, H plus ions, into the space. It's like pumping up a tire or pumping up a rugby ball. And then when the pressure is high on that side, those H plus molecules run through complex five, and it's like a little propeller type of thing. And they turn this part of the molecule and they make ATP. Chemical processes happen here. They create Protons, they get pumped into this side, and when the pressure is up, the pressure is used, like hydroelectric um, pressure, to drive a turbine. Um, this molecule is like a turbine, and that turbine makes ATP molecules, which is like petrol in our body. This is a more detailed view, and I want you to notice there is something called CoQ10, which is a cofactor for complex two. CoQ10 is crucially important. If it doesn't, if it's not present, this molecule cannot work. Why do I call on CoQ10 or why do I actually even mention it? Because many drugs damage CoQ10. For instance, statins. They damage CoQ10 and they block CoQ10. So if you don't have CoQ10, if you take cholesterol medications, you will damage your mitochondria. And that, of course, eventually affects your heart. This is the active process. As I've said, proton molecules get pumped into the intermembrane space between the two membranes, and then it's pushed back through this little turbine, and there is your ATP. Amazing stuff. What's interesting is if you use this process with oxygen, it's called OxFOS, oxidative phosphorylation, from one molecule of sugar, you get 36 ATP molecules. Now we'll talk about a second mechanism and it's called fermentation. And their glucose is used to one glucose molecule only makes two ATPs. And this is what cancer cell uses. And we will talk about it a lot. So cancer cells ferment, they don't use oxygen, healthy cells use oxygen. Okay, so number one, mitochondria make energy. They also switch the body. They like the chip. They like the brain of the body. They tell a cell when to divide. They tell a cell when to die. They tell a cell when to do what. So they are really the brain behind everything that happens in our metabolism in the body. And this is the summary. So remember, when you think of mitochondria, they, they put out energy and signals. And I will give you many other examples of why this is so important. 
Okay, this is the middle. They regulate cells, they provide the power, they're like a little generator. They also manage reactive oxygen species, which is ROS, reaction oxygen species. That's a molecule that is burned. It's like the black smoke from a land cruiser when it's working hard. You can see it coming out the exhaust. And that is reactive oxygen species. Apoptosis, meaning the cell dies by itself. It, it disintegrates and it dies. And they make other macromolecules that are important for the body. For instance, they make melatonin. And then we've said already they can fuse together or they can split and destroy the. This is one of the key molecules in the mitochondria. And I've put it in here just to show you where these things work. They're, it's incredible. So we, as humans, if we develop a drug that would, for instance, tackle this CK2, and we are extremely proud and we charge thousands of dollars just to block this one thing, you can get an understanding how, how, how feeble our attempts are to run our life. It's actually much, much more complicated. This is some scientific background basically saying that mitochondria and the reactive oxygen species that they do are signals to other body organelles. So by pushing out more or less smoke, it's like a train going past. If you don't see smoke, you know, you know it's not pulling very hard. If it's fuming black smoke, it's pulling hard. Or if it's like in Namibia, where it's nearly burning, you think the thing's burning, then you know the mitochondria are nearly dying. They are damaged, they cannot function properly anymore, and you know there's a big problem. So mitochondria in my world are like the computer in a huge factory. If the factory doesn't get enough electricity, or if the computer that guides all these robots doesn't work, this factory is not going to do anything. And in our body, there is a specific level of reactive oxygen species. If it's perfect, we have got perfect health. If the reactive oxygen species are too little, eventually we get apoptosis, the cells will die. And if it goes too high, the mitochondria go overboard, and eventually we've got excessive growth or then even cancer. What damages mitochondria? Now you will see... I've written there before 2018, mitochondria are very sensitive to viruses, to certain bacterial proteins, to heavy metals, toxins from the environment, pharmaceuticals, if you are in stress, and then also all the um, components on the right-hand side, herbicides, insecticides, electrosmog, cell, cell fans, <laughs> change mitochondrial function, and I've said there, it changes your reactive oxygen species, they go up structures in the mitochondria, and eventually you end up with cancer. We've got a new kid on the block, and on the top left there, S1 spike protein, and this is where the connection comes between cancer and mitochondria and COVID-19. COVID-19 on its surface has got a man-made, manipulated surface protein, it's called the S1 spike protein. Today's talk is not about showing you where this protein was made. All I can say, it was originally funded and designed by entities that were associated with the DOD in the USA. DOD is Department of Defense in the, in the United States, and it was part and parcel of gain-of-function research. Gain-of-function is bioweapons research that is supposed to make people sicker as a weapon. So that I'm going to leave it there, but the S1 protein is probably the most toxic protein that we know today in our environment. And I've got this stuff there. It damages mitochondria, changes, mitochondria don't work anymore, and that's the link to turbo cancer. So to sum up the last 20 minutes, if we look at mitochondria and we study them and we see that they are damaged eventually, we arrive at why they influence, if not, I don't want to say they're the only factor, but they are maybe the main factor in driving cancer. The next few slides are quite technical. It's okay. I'm going to jump through them early or quickly. 
but it's just to show you that all the science is there, okay? So mitochondria, if the stress goes up, the signals change, and then certain proteins get switched on. It's like a, it's like a stress response. The mitochondria will talk to other cells in the body and say, listen, guys, there's big trouble. There's a virus here or there's some toxin here, and we have to make a plan. We can't carry on like this. Um, be aware, we have to switch on emergency systems, emergency generators, and we have to change things. Genomic instability could also be said as mutations. If you guys are sitting elsewhere, take a photo of this slide because it's really crucial. Oxidative phosphorylation gets damaged, then the membrane potential changes, the protein transport changes, everything goes downwards. And at the end, we have mitochondrial DNA changes and they end up in mutation. These are two switches. You could say there are specific switches in the mitochondria that switch on so-called pro-inflammatory systems. And technically, you could say on the left-hand side, it used to be lipopolysaccharides from bacteria, which is a protein that's on the surface of bacteria, and today we have the spike protein, as I said. They switch on NF-kappa-B and they switch on mTOR. And at the end of the day, when these, six, when these two factors are switched on, you get abnormal growth, you get inflammation, and you get cancer. Why is this important? Because many of the therapies and support protocols that we will use in the end, they actually stop or calm down these two um, transcription factors. So a simpler way would be to hey, say NF-kappa-B gets switched up, cytokines, which are chemicals in the body that will switch your inflammation in the body on, and they stimulate cell growth, and they stop cells from dying. Where do we see that? If we've got a wound, say you've got a big cut, your cytokines get revved up, your inflammation gets revved up, and your cells start growing. And then once that wound is healed up, your body in a normal um, place will switch this whole mechanism off and it will calm down and you'll, you will have scar tissue, but you don't have active growth anymore. Now, in a cancer situation, it gets switched on, but it doesn't get switched on, so it carries on growing. And this is where cancer is basically out of control. It carries on and on, and it doesn't stop growing. The retrograde response means that mitochondria pick up a problem and they send signals to the cell nucleus of your cell. In other words, they are telling your cell, hang on guys, there is a problem, go and switch into emergency mode. And I'm going to run through some slides here. You have got too little oxygen, which is hypoxia, or you've got too many reactive oxygen species, too many toxins and damaged mitochondrial DNA. Then they will say, help, help, SOS, membrane potential drops, ATP, the energy drops, calcium metabolism changes, and then all sorts of things are switched on, which call inflammation. And these are the factors. You don't have to remember them all. Those are the chemical pathways that the body has to switch on 120 different genes. And this changes the metabolism from a normal healthy cell to a cancer cell. The cancer cell stops dying. And eventually, the cancer cell's invasive tendency means the cancer cell will not only be in the tumor, it will start moving to other places in the body. So that's the beginning of cancer. This retrograde response can be switched off if the triggers are removed. That's what this article said. Why is that important? If you remove the stuff that drove the cancer, the cancer will not just come back. What does it mean? It means in simple terms, if you've had a car in Swakopmund, which is very corrosive for six years, it's rusted, you take it to the panel beater, he fixes it up, it comes back after a month, you put it in the same place for the next six years, your chances are that it's rusted again are like 100%. So my, my take from this is, and this is what this program is about, if people have gone through this whole process, if they've gone through the trauma of having a cancer diagnosis and they've come out on the other end, 
They need to do something different. It's nothing specific. It's nothing fancy. It's just common sense. So what is tumor metabolism? What do tumors love? You can see the first thing that I've written there is glucose. Glucose is sugar. Full stop. So anyone who says your diet doesn't matter and glucose is okay, and if you walk into some place and you get a cancer treatment and afterwards you get a, a fruit juice with 10% glucose in, you actually defeating the whole aim of the purpose or the purpose of the of the whole treatment. The second thing cancer cells can use is glutamine, which is an amino acid, and we'll talk about it. So, and the third part that they use, if other cancer cells die, they eat them up, like duck pencils. In the movie, we've got these little crickets. You ride, drive over them on the road, and then their family will come and eat them up. They don't waste anything. That's what <laughs> ca cancer cells do. And they can use basically certain nitrogen molecules. The main fuel for cancer is glucose and glutamine. And where is it used? If you have a PET scan, which is a specific molecule, they use a sugar molecule, a glucose molecule, and they attach a radioactive dye to it, and they inject it into you, and then they put your body in a scanner, and the scanner will pick up all the places. You can see these dark spots. Those are all the places where cancer is and cancer picks up that sugar one shot, and then the radiologist or oncologist can see where the cancer is active. So the fact that oncologists use that glucose molecule to do their testing should actually show you that this is what cancer prefers. So anybody with anything to do with cancer should completely and utterly understand that and then thrive to get away from sugar. So once a tumor starts growing, it goes into the local tissues. Eventually, it moves out, out of the local tissues. It moves into lymph systems. It moves into blood vessels. And it goes along in the body and then in a different place. And often it's in the lung or in the kidney or the liver where you've got very tiny little vessels. These cells, these cancer cells that have survived, and on number three, I've said their immune survival. Normal cancer cells, if you're healthy, get killed in the blood within minutes. But if your immune system is not working properly, they've got lots of time to float around the body. It's like a couple of thieves that roam a city. If a city is well structured and security is in place, they will get taken up, picked up, they won't get very far. But if the city is not organized anymore, if it's chaos, they can mo move around the whole day and nothing will happen to them. So eventually they will come out in a place and they'll establish a new home in a different space. And this is what calls metastasis. This is a picture you can see there. Number one, the cells change. They form a little lump. And angiogenesis means new blood vessels get stimulated and they start growing. So with new blood vessels, all of a sudden, the cancer can grow. The first stage, the transformation, everyone, you could say older than 10 years has got cancer cells and they sit there for years and years and years and nothing happens. And the day new blood vessels grow into that area, they can start growing. And eventually they go into the blood vessels or lymph systems, they move along, they end up in the lung and they move out of the lung and at the bottom you can see it there. You've got the picture and it's actually a nice graphic where it's moved into the lung and it's got metastases in the lung. What do they have to do together? Once again, mitochondria are crucial. The mitochondria and the cancer system, they are different. And yet, they are involved in this metastases cycle. So here you have got more electrons, complex one to four don't work very well anymore in the electron transfer chain, so you don't make, make as much energy. You cannot produce uh, protons, less protons, more electrons, more oxygen, and therefore you've got hydrogen peroxide, which increases your reactive oxygen species. A whole lot of genes get switched on, and then you have on the left and the right hand side activation of nuclear genes, invasive tendency in that metastasis. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, if your mitochondria are messed up, 
they will switch on specific switches in the switchboard that eventually make the cancer move to other places. Full stop. Please note that mitochondria are always involved. I can repeat that. They are always involved. Interesting. NAC and CoQ10, which are both substances that are really mild, that are easy, um, will revert part of these pathways. And they are part and parcel of the Namibian <coughs> Cancer Support Protocol. This is just another indication. This mitochondria are in the middle of this. Thing. Look at this incredible system where they are involved. They sit in the middle and they are, you could say it's like the microchip in a modern car. Your takeaway from the first 40 minutes of this talk is mitochondria are important. <clears throat> they are the Honda generators and they are the switchboard. So when I sum up what I've said the first couple of minutes here, I'll give you time to read this. And I want you to understand that mitochondria, when they move into cancer, are a switch that helps the body survive. It's evolution in reverse. Long ago, we were single cell organisms. Single cells don't give a damn about the next cell. All they do is they grow and reproduce. They take all the nutrients that they can and they excrete all the toxins away from them. That's all they do. And I'll give you some really scary and fascinating analogies in society because we can see the same sort of pattern in society when people are stressed. So what I'm saying is our modern environment with whatever we experience puts the body and the mitochondria under stress and then to survive, they move into a single cell logic survival mode. As simple as that. It's a completely different theory than to the genetic theory, okay? Because if I understand this theory, I will not go after genetics anymore. I will go after the environment and after healthy supplements and stuff like that. I will try anything to keep the mitochondria happy and function. So this is the analogy. You will see at the back is an organized cities. There will be rules, there will be taxes, there will be organized power supplies, there will be access control, there will be security, everything. And when you push these people, and this is South America, it's the same thing. We are a multi-unit, highly integrated system. And when you push a certain component to the ground and they cannot survive, they go into something and they only look for food, they reproduce and they have a shelter. And for the rest, they don't care anymore. They can't because they haven't got the capacity. So this is my summary. We've got the governing structures which very often in these situations are kleptocratic elites. They steal from the rest and they enrich themselves. And these groups that get into that stress, they have to make a plan to survive and that's what they do. And the result in, in, in social environments is what we see when we have these, we call them squatter camps or informal settlements. So let's sum up here, mitochondrial dysfunction will damage your energy and it will damage your signaling and it will change your whole metabolic system so that you can end up with multiple growth or what you could say a cancer biology. Now, this is an article that I pulled up and this whole talk and this whole concept grew over many years and it ended up being a cancer monologue, but it came from a long COVID program. So this is my link to long COVID. You can see here this article, which was published in 2022, like two, a year and a half ago, clearly shows that mitochondrial dysfunction is a prelude to long COVID. And this is why I've been supporting my long COVID patients with an extremely strong focus on the mitochondria. And it comes from all that knowledge that's been pulled together. It gives me a big picture. It gives me a roadmap to actually find my way and to, to give me a point of where I want to help them. So neuropathology is damage to your nervous system. So that's your brain fog, that's your anxiety, that's your um, depression. If your brain is damaged, if your mitochondria and the brain is damaged, then your brain won't function properly. This is even more important. These articles came out even earlier, I think 2020, if I'm not 
And this put me on the road to actually look at mitochondria and they are the main organizers of your immune system. So if your immune system is functioning, you will have functioning mitochondria. If your mitochondria are damaged, your immune system cannot function the way it should be. These are just some graphics. Don't worry about them. It just always shows you you have in the middle mitochondria and it tells you all the things. Activated T cells, those are the killer cells, macrophages, everything. This is just about the immune system. Once again, even more complicated. You can look at that. And then there's an asked another article. This one is recent. Um, I think it's even, yeah, it's from this year. So I found it a couple of weeks ago. Altered mitochondrial respiration in mononuclear cells. Mononuclear cells, monocytes, are cells that are killer cells in the blood. They pick up all the wrong, they pick up bacteria, they pick up viruses, they pick up, pick up everything in your blood that shouldn't be there. And they can also move into their tissue. When they move from the blood in the blood, they call monocytes. And when they move into the tissue, they call it phagocytes. So this is from that same article. If you look at all these symptoms, they are long COVID symptoms. Don't you know them all? Haven't you heard about them all? And then at the bottom, increased ATP linked respiration. In other words, respiration, immune system tries to compensate, and then it says mitochondrial dysfunction in the immune system. Okay. So those are some technicals from the article. I put it in for my medical colleagues that they can look and study it. It's not so important for us here today. And I want to show you this dysfunction is due, partly due to the extensive viral targeting of mitochondria and proteins. So in other words, there is one protein damages mitochondria, and that has a massive impact on our immune system. This is a video. The link is there. You can look it up. It's a video that I made for patients and their families on long COVID. And this is the same one in a German version, which I shared with German colleagues in January, as you will see there. So this is really interesting stuff. If you want to understand the whole thing, you, it might be worth it to look at that as well sometime. So let's look at normal medicine. Now, a long COVID patient goes to his normal GP and the GP says, I don't know what's wrong with you. He will send him to a specialist. And if you look at the list of medications that are on the screen here, you will find a whole lot that we use in standard medicine to treat specific symptoms. The sad part of it, all these medications damage mitochondria. And I think you know now why, where, I'm going, where I'm going to. This is the second one. You look at the heart medications. You look at the antiarrhythmics. They get dished out a lot because people have got heart problems. So the doctor normally says, this is what I give you. He wants to stop the symptom. He does stop the symptom, and maybe the patient will feel a bit better, but in the long run, he's causing a lot of damage. There is my friend, statins, okay? the best-selling drug before vaccines in the world. They're supposed to lower your cholesterol. They block cholesterol in the liver, and your body makes 80% of cholesterol itself. Cholesterol is the mother molecule of all your sex hormones, male and female, of cortisol, of vitamin D. Imagine if you now block the mother molecule downstream, you will influence all those molecules, okay? Just to lower cholesterol. And here again, they damage mitochondria. Anesthetics, we use it every day in dentistry. And then tetracyclines, antibiotics. Remember I told you, mitochondria are ancient bacteria. So when you have bacteria and you give them antibiotics, you will damage. That's the purpose of it. And then at the bottom, anxiety medication, antipsychotics, they get given to patients with long COVID because they come along and they say, I feel miserable. The doctors cannot find anything on their labs. They eventually say it's in your mind. It give you a little sedation pulse. So now we're getting to the point where these two are linked. Modern cancer care, say a patient goes to the cancer center and they do everything that they are taught to do and they become more and more sophisticated, more elaborate and more and more technical. And these are the main systems they use. And this comes from a cancer monograph and I've given you the link. This is a group under the guidance of Dr. Paul Merrick. Now, Paul Merrick is an ex-South African living in America today. And they've got this group 
frontline doctors, uh, frontline uh, critical something care. critical care doctors in incredible group. And they came out with this cancer monologue. And I based a lot of my thinking. I had started this thing last year, early, early last year. But when this thing came out, I said, wow, this is amazing because it's a lot of what I do. The only difference being they use medications to achieve something. And I've got my mitochondria in the back. So I don't want, I don't want to use medications that in any case uh, harm mitochondria. So the end result is. Cancer treatments today are used to reduce tumors, to make them smaller, okay? And they kill fast-growing cells. That's why your hair falls out. That's why you struggle with swelling because your mucus slime uh, membranes get damaged. They, and you've got all those side effects from chemo, for instance, is due to those two. They are excellent at reducing tumors, but they cannot eliminate tumor stem cells. And this is something that you guys all have to know. On the left here, we've got a tumor and the gray ones or purple ones are these tumor stem cells. That's the mom and dad and the granny and granddad. Now you club everything with chemotherapy, all the young ones, the, the ones that grow fast, die away. And these guys sit there still, okay? It's like an omachete bush. You take a bulldozer and you burn it and you bulldoze it. And after two seasons, you've got 10 little omachetes coming out. This group regroups and they say, hang on, we got clubbed with this thing last time. We have to make a different, we use a different strategy. And they come out with different tumors and they are resistant to all the other stuff. And this is nothing new. I think the cancer industry knows it but they still keep on trying only to use specific therapies to debulk. In other words, to get the cancer so you cannot see it anymore. They want to push the cancer back under the carpet and then say to you, you're okay now. That's okay. They achieve something. But my take is you have to do something else. And this is what the rest of the talk today is going to be about. This comes from FLCCC. You can see there the differences. What's really important is Chemotherapy and modern cancer therapy is really, really expensive. What I'm trying to show you here today is much more affordable. And you can look at this in your own time. So the effects on mitochondria, and this is what we've talked about, and we go to some research articles. They are from a year and a half back. You can have a look. Make it two years. I'll give you time to read this. So I've spent the last 45 minutes explaining to you how when you damage your mitochondria, you will end up with cancer. And now the cancer treatment is clearly shown to damage mitochondria. So what does that leave you with? We have to find another way, okay? So cancer drugs introduce mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, which eventually damages. It also damages the heart and the brain, okay? We call it side effects. So the long-term outcome, I've summed it up here. Not just cancer treatment, many things, COVID and the S1, and remember, COVID is one, you get it from an infection and you get it from a vaccine. When you get it from an infection, you get it once and then you're pretty immune to it. When you get it from a vaccine, especially if it's a genetic vaccine, your body produces this toxic spike protein over and over and over again. The longest studies now are over two years. So it's a completely different ball game. And the end result is that your mitochondria are damaged, okay? When it's damaged, immune system doesn't work. And when it's not working, what's keeping your immune system at bay or your uh, cancers at bay, your immune system. And then you get cancer. And then we have a treatment that creates more damage to your mitochondria. I don't know, does that make sense so far to you guys? And I think it's very different. It might feel you, it might let you feel despondent but it's actually the opposite. Because the moment we know what's potting and the moment we know where these things are act, uh, working, then we can start thinking of new ideas and plans. And this is what we're going to do. So this is my take home message. Um, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just the way it is. So I don't put a value on this. Everybody can look at it and they can decide. So I've got a silly analogy. If you have a government where the government is corrupt, doesn't know what to do, and the guidance, the microchip from the government doesn't work, you should replace that government. And if you look at the South African context, if you fix ESCOM and you fix the government to make them honest and efficient, 
South Africa would probably be the best country in the world. All right. So Einstein had lots of clever quirks. Einstein suggested that when something isn't working or the tools we have, we think of new things. And this is my tack. So in a nutshell, when we move to what from where, what we know to what we should be doing, we should focus on that that's going to help us. So that's our mitochondria and our immune system. And it's really shockingly simple. Once you understand that, you know where you're going. I don't want patients to fight cancer. Why not? If you're in a war, if you're in an aggressive situation, if you're running away from a tiger, you will not build a new house. If you look at the spaces in the world, you look at Ukraine, you look at Gaza at the moment, there will be no new road built now. They are fighting each other. What does it mean for us? When you're in sympathetic mode, when you're in panic mode, first thing that is switched off, your immune system completely. Secondly, your digestive system. Digestive system meaning you get the good stuff in and you get the horrible stuff out. That doesn't work anymore. Third thing is your logical brain. You cannot think anymore. You act by instinct, by fear. And that's the last thing you need in that situation. You do not want to be in panic station. So what's my talk? If you come along and you've got a cancer diagnosis and you say, Martin, my doctor told me I've got a cancer. They've taken a biopsy. And I say to the patient, you feel okay? They say, I'm feeling absolutely fine. I say, wouldn't it be cool if we could just keep it like that? Like where it was for the last 40 years. You don't have to eradicate it. Just keep it where it was. Stop it from getting more. Okay, And this is what this whole protocol is about. So if you want to get involved in this, we know we humans will not survive on this earth if we are alone. So we need new solutions. And this is my summary. It's a little bit philosophical. But you guys have been involved in it. We've had contact with cancer or cancer survivors or whatever you call them. Cancer is actually not about life and death. Life and death is with us every single day. Whether we have we are conscious or not, it doesn't matter. It's more the trauma, the worry, the emotional, you know, terror and the helplessness and the thought of dying that is messing up our life. And cancer really, in my world, is about quality of life. So why do I put it in here that when we treat somebody, we should use less focus on the time he can live, but more focus on how will that life be? I don't know if that makes sense. So this comes from Hippocrates, making a habit of two things to help. Yes, that's what we're talking about today, or at least not harm. So in my world, I'm not a doctor. Why is that great? Because I've got a certain space, I've got enough information of medicine, but I'm not locked into it as much as other doctors do. So I can do my own stuff, I can compile my own thinking, and I can make, I've called it there, a farmer plan. So in the movie, I would say, we, we are just, we make a plan. If you've got a problem, you think of something unusual and you go with it. And then take that plan and take it back to the community. So why do we have this today? This program is really about the people that have gone through their primary care, that have gone through all the uh, oncology issues, and now they want a place where they can get more information, where they can get more guidance, where they really <clears throat> have a better maintenance plan for the long term. Okay, and is it going to be expensive? I don't think so. Is it going to be that difficult? I don't think so. And we'll look at that. I base my stuff on these people. And you see Thomas Seyfried at the top. You also see Paul Merrick. You see Jason Fung. You see Thomas Rao, which is a Swiss professor. And then I've taken a couple. There are hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of these people in the world. So it's not Martin Wucher, who is now being a dentist, trying to be clever. And this is what I envisage. So I've got the knowledge at the top. That's what I've done to a certain extent. Okay. And then we've got cancer coaches, we call them C coaches, people like Rosal or Elise that will sit with the patients one-on-one -on -one for a certain time, teach them everything they need to know, show them where they can get the resources, provide some of the resources, and then at the bottom, and this is where Margot and you guys can maybe become involved, cancer friends, I've called them cancer friends. Why? Cancer survivors is a is a silly name. It's a person that you can trust, that you can share with. It's a community. And I really believe that we are at a stage where we have to have more connection between people and less indoctrination from the top. 
Because when you can speak one-on-one -on -one like we are here today, you can share your inner most genuine feelings and worries and, and experiences. When you get something through the TV or through the public media, it's not just information, it's manipulation. So um, I'm a great advocate of looking for information elsewhere if you want it, but speak to your neighbor, speak to your peer, speak to the people. Right, this is my biological background. So omnipresent intelligence. Some people may call it God, okay? Nature is organized by some incredible intelligence. And then I've pulled out 10 things that I think I see time and time again. It's self-reliant. It needs energy, it needs communication, and it needs resources. And they get, how can I say, integrated into a living, a, a lovely, into life, okay? And at the bottom, which is important, you can see dynamically engaged. If you don't get engaged and you sit dead still, that means death. Multiple endpoints. We cannot predict what will happen in the end, but we can work in a certain direction. If you plant a garden and you put a seed down, you will not know what the plant looks like in the end, but you will know it might be a lemon or a, a lemon tree or it might be a palm tree. So this, and there is no silver bullet. Mechanical thinking is, I've got a flat tire, I take the tire off, I put a new tire on and I'm done. Nature doesn't work like that. That tree on the left is estimated to be over 3,000 years old. Do you really think in that time he went to see a doctor? Do you really think he had a police looking at him? Do you really think he was vaccinated 74 times like American people by the time they get 30? We are on the wrong track. Technology cannot replace nature. Technology cannot replace biology, no matter what we do, okay? We'll always come back to this. I often show this box. People ask me and say, are you alternative? Are you an alternative medicine doctor? I say no, because when I'm in a car accident, I want to go to the hospital. I want to have surgery. The modern acute medicine, they are fantastic. They can keep me alive. So it's part and parcel of our society. We are lucky we have it here in Namibia. And I would not miss them. I don't want to. We not want to go back to cavemen. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to take the other side as well. So we go to the acute medicine if we in dire straits. And then afterwards, we think like God, and this is what we do today. We take the toxic stuff away, like we do it here. What would the gardener do? First thing is, and I've asked this to thousands of people, and they all say, I'm going to clean up first. And they use, when we get to the bottom of it, it's the man-made stuff. It's not the twigs or the dead fish in the middle. Then you provide resources. That could be fertilizer, that could be water, that could be whatever the, the nature needs. And you back off, you leave it, and you give it time. And guess what? It'll sort itself. It's a scary, simple thing. But we've been so far removed from this thinking that we don't even consider it anymore. And for us humans, if we want to enter that space, we have to start thinking differently. We have to start asking critical questions. And these are my levels that I have in my world. Now, everybody can have different you know, graphics or ideas. You will see that at the bottom, emergency medicine is life support. And they use drugs and they use emergency medicine. I cannot work on a person in a decent manner if I don't have local anesthetic. So I use it every day. I also use antibiotics if there is a time for it. The rest, mindset that the patient has to do and the other green one the patient also has to do. And then come, you could say, the coaching, which is a part of functional medicine. You teach people what they can and should not do. In the case of the spike protein, it was simple. In our long spike protein protocols, the first thing we do is get the blood thinner and then try and remove the toxin. Because if you remove the toxin, the body will be much, much better. This is a really <clears throat> very simple framework of the programs that we give to patients. We talk about foods. We give them different techniques to calm down, to get away from that sympathetic, from the running away of panic. We want to get them into the parasympathetic stage. That's your resting, recovery, healing stage. And to do that, you can do various techniques. Here they are some. Then remember I talked about mitophagy, when the mitochondria remove the old crappy ones and they grow new ones. 
keto foods, low calorie, cold, cold showers. The old ladies that go to swim in Swakopmund every morning, they kill their rubbish mitochondria every morning and they get new ones grown. That's why they never die. Okay. <laughs> and they're mentally fit. Okay. It's crazy. Sleeping grounded. Jack is there. I'll show some slides later on. We look we talk about sleep routine, about your natural cycles, about light, about bedtime routines, about eating superfoods, what what what. So Okay, so this is Thomas Seyfried. We've spoken about him. The article that he published in 2020, and he's actually started earlier, much earlier on. You will see that cancer book was written in 2017. Um, yeah, that one at the bottom of it. Yeah, that thicker one. It's a lady. She's, she's a professional dietitian or something, and she had a son that had a brain tumor. And she went through the whole process with everything that conventional treatments could provide. And then on her own, she started ketogenic diets. And with her son, eventually he died. But out came that book, and it's her passion now to help people talk about it, teaching them all that. So it's part and parcel of her life journey. And Thomas Seyfried wrote the foreword because they obviously had a lot of to each other. So Thomas Seyfried, as I've showed you before, this is another article. He says, when there are tumors, mitochondria are involved. We know that already. We don't have to go back. And he says they use glucose and glutamine. That we've also covered already. And now he said, if you combined therapeutic diets, and they're talking about the ketogenic diet, you will have a, a different outcome. This 6 diazo 5 oxo l mule Don, is a drug, a chemical drug. It's a cancer drug. And they use it in a specific way because it blocks glutamine metabolism. Remember, that's the other food that the cells take. So that has to be done under the guidance of an oncologist. But if you use them together, it kills tumor cells. In this case, it was a brain tumor. So Thomas Seyfried called this therapy, he called it the press pulse therapy. And this is basically what I copied to a certain extent. I modified it, changed it. And you will see how. So ultimately, at the bottom, you want to boost your mitochondria and you want to put cancer cells under stress. You want to push them down. Okay. So let's look at the cellular mechanism behind it. In the middle, we've got carbohydrates. That's your bread and your rolls and your cookies and your donuts and your sugar sweets and your Coke and all this stuff. It ends up in glucose. And glucose gets used as pyruvate and it gets pushed. This is the mitochondria. You add oxidase, um, oxygen and it makes ATP. That's great. Cancer cells don't use oxidative phosphorylation. They use fermentation. So they still use sugar, but they don't use it as well. So what we want to do is we want to take the fuel away from the cancer cell. And there are two fuels, glucose and glutamine. How do we do that? Stop the fuel here. And that means they don't have power anymore. And when they don't have power anymore and they tie it, and I've put this thing here, if you want to hijack a, a biker, you will not hijack him at the bottom where he's just come down the hill and he's going at 70 pace an hour. You will, you will jump on him at the, nearly the top when he's tired and he can hardly move. And this is what we want to do with cancer cells. We want to really keep them pushed down. That's the press. You press them down and then you pluck them with stuff that I'm going to show you. So, first of all, the patient has to learn what to do. This is what this program is about. Teaching, teaching, teaching. Doctor comes from dosary. Dosary means teaching. So the doctors should teach the patients what to do, like it was in old days. Not just give them something to swap. When the patient knows that and they commit it, they know what to do. And this whole thing is designed not that I have to sit with them in every day until he dies one day. The process is to give him the tools to tool box everything that he needs so that after six months, they can carry on with their life in a way that they decide. I don't want to be their guardian forever. I want to empower them okay, and give them a tool that they can share with them. Okay, second, we've got, we've got the keto diet. Press maintenance, keto, keto, keto. Every now and then later, you can back off a week or two and go back. It'll be easy. But that's how nature had it for us. And the last one is, and this is what the rest of the talk is about, 
anti-cancer agents. So we want metabolic stress. This is not for you. This is against the cancer cells. The toxic burden is stuff the cancer cells definitely don't like. Then recover and then repeat the whole thing. And underneath, this is my mitochondrial thing. Our mitochondria are the goodies that we want to pep up and look after. This is a different way of showing us. So with a ketogenic diet, sometimes if you can afford it, if you have got enough body fat and that, we will introduce intermittent fasting, meaning say you skip the breakfast, like I haven't eaten breakfast today. I don't ever eat breakfast. I eat my, drink my coffee or green tea, whatever. And now we've started eat, uh, adding some fatty stuff so that I go into ketosis. Anyway, oxidative therapies, we'll talk about that, which means you put a lot of oxygen in and the cancer cells that are struggling, they don't like oxygen. Remember, they are like the cells before the earth got so much oxygen, they cannot handle it because the mitochondria are the protective thing and the mitochondria and cancer cells don't work. So if you give them lots of oxygen, it's like bacteria that cannot live with oxygen. They don't like it. And then we've got substances that are called the killing pulses. And then, of course, we want to optimize your immune response. Repeat, repeat, repeat. You learn something, you go and use cancer, uh, keto and fasting, you pulse, pulse, give it a pause, pulse again, and so we carry on. Ketogenic diet is not that easy, but we've got nice resources. And I want to go back to one of the old pioneers in this space, uh, Prof. Tim Noakes. He used to be a professor at UCT at Cape Town. In the meantime, he's, he's involved with many other places. And like so many times, when you are far ahead of your profession, you get nailed. You know, they don't like it. And this is what happened to him. His own profession, the university, his peers, and of course, the whole medical fraternity jumped on it. He went through a couple of court cases. And guess what? After everything is done and dusted, he was right. And everybody looks up to him today. He's a world-renowned person now. He's had the guts. He's like Pierre Corey in a certain way in America. He's like Paul Merrick. Paul Merrick is another South African there's another one, Tess Laurie, in, U- in the UK. Tess Laurie is one of the most forest proponents, has warned people about the vaccine and all the damage it goes with it. And these are South Africans that have got guts and they've got brains to see what's coming. And they look for new options and they are extremely committed. That You could say many of them have risked their profession and their life to actually send out the truth in the world. And they, in my world, are role models that I feel really indebted to because society will not survive without these people. This is another one. His life is health and teaching people good healthcare choices. He's a naturopathic doctor. Why have I got him here? He's got a lot of ketogenic diet and good stuff. Jason Fung is a nephrologist in Canada. Incredible person. Many books about um, diabetes, about keto diets and so on. He's amazing. I love him. And then I've jumped back. I've looked around. You need a keto meter, a keto meter that can measure uh, glucose in your blood and ketones at the same time. There is a famous one. It's called Keto Mojo. You can buy them online. We've been looking around here in the country. We haven't actually 100% established where we can get them. Elise, yeah, you, you had a look and Rosal had a look. We will, we will find a space and that's part and parcel of our teaching to the people that we show them where they can get what. And what it comes to, you measure your glucose and you measure your ketones and you divide the one by the other and you should have a ratio between one and three. That tells you you're in a, in a space where your cancer cells don't feel very happy, okay? But your brain and everything else feels great. This is an amazing website. If you want to take a photo, have a look at it. It's a really fascinating, it's well made up. And all I've done is <clears throat> I've put the link in because I don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's one of the resources that we definitely will provide to patients. Okay. All right. And this is the book that's done the rounds. I like it. It's very, very comprehensive. Not everybody will manage to go right through it, but for those people who want to really get delved deep into this, that's the thing. So here we go. Now, and Dr. Paul Merrick went along and he said, 
I'm going to look at repurposed drugs. In other words, drugs that are established that have been around for years. And I'm going to look at the ones that might have been used for inflammation, but now they also have anti-cancer properties. And one of them, for instance, for one of them that we all, that there's been a lot of talk about is ivermectin. Now, ivermectin is a worm medicine. But ivermectin has got incredible things. It kills viruses, it blocks viruses, and guess what? It manipulates and it kills cancer cells. So you'll hear about that. But what I've added, and this is why I show this to I want to damage cancer cells, so I want an anti-cancer effect, but I don't want mitochondrial toxic effects. So minocycline or NSA, which is cataflame stuff, yes, some of them will will have an effect on cancer, but they will also damage mitochondria. So in my world, I've discarded them, okay? This stuff, proton pump inhibitors. When your, ma when your stomach uh, makes too much stomach acid and you've got heartburn, the doctor will say, I'm gonna give you omeprazole or whatever it is. It's a proton pump inhibitor. I showed you those little protons that get pumped into the space. If you block your proton pumps in the cells that make acid, it will block the proton pumps in every mitochondria in your body. It's a nightmare scenario. You don't want that stuff. You have to find another way, and there are many other ways. I've shown you this before. This is one of the drills. This guy lived 2,400 years ago, and to think what they knew and what they observed was just fascinating. These were my search criteria when I was doing this work. Okay, so I typed in anti-spike and I typed in anti-cancer, and I came up with a whole lot of you know, substances that can do both. So they will, they will influence cancer and they will influence the spike and they will actually boost mitochondria and they will help your general health. So once again, cancer therapies focus on that stuff that you can see, that you can detect with your eyes or with certain machines or with scans. They cannot detect the stuff that's invisible to the eye. There are some... Techniques in America, they're very expensive. They cost about a thousand US dollar a shot where you can go, you draw some blood. It's called like a liquid biopsy. And they search for cancer stem cells. And that is a really valuable. You could go, take some blood samples, screen for those stem cells, and then see if they are still around or if they're around already before they've made a metastasis. And it's, it's, a, it's a new level of research that's coming out. It's not cheap, but it's, I think, a really valuable thing. Also in a case like yours, I've been through and you can see, it's called liquid biopsy. This is my lash, okay? They, I found about 50 plus, but you can't work with 50 plus. So it, it's just overwhelming what is there, what's available, what's available. And this to me is the good news today for you guys, okay? Because we will have ketogenic diet and lifestyle as a background. And that includes body movements, cold showers, earthing mats, whatever anybody can provide. Plus, then we will give the patients this stuff every now and then. This is another way of putting it. And this is what I call the pulse site. Remember, the press side is the one side and the other side is the pulse side. And then I've put them into blocks. Why? Because I don't want to use the same thing all the time. Because cancers are incredibly clever. If you use something all the time, it'll take two, three, six months and they will find a way around it. So we don't go there. We, we go in for one month with one group or even one thing. And then the next month we go with another thing. And it keeps it cheap, keeps it affordable. It keeps it really horrible for the cancer. Because he's just managed to survive the one thing and the next month it'll be a different thing. And now comes the really exciting part. And I'm going to run through this really quickly because it's such a lot of information. If there was a solar bullet, it's my number one. There are cancer clinics that when that patient walks in with a cancer diagnosis, they go to 120 nanograms per mil. I've got patients, and that I learned from Dr. Coimbra in, America, in, in Brazil, Cicero Coimbra. He works with MS patients. He gives his patients... When they've got MS and they walk into his practice or any autoimmune disease, he gives them 1,000 units per kilogram body weight per day for the first year. 
that 70,000 per day. We've got patients that have been going for four or five years with blood vitamin D of 220 or higher. Um, if, you, if you want to see a German website, Raymond von der Helden, he's probably one of the most knowledgeable um, vitamin D people in Germany. He's a medical doctor and he's done a lot of research in his... All right, so we're talking about vitamin D. Um, and vitamin D is the central hormone. It's a pro-hormone. It's really a hormone. And it, I've taken this picture because all these cells are immune cells. CD8, CD4, dendritic cells are um, antigen-presenting cells. Macrophages are the monocytes that move into the tissue. CD4 cells, MNF. So it influences that. It modulates the immune system. Now, if I say modulate, it means it makes it strong where you want it strong and it calms it down where you want it calmed down. So this is what you do. Cortisol and cortisone switches the immune system off. If you've got a red patch, you want it to go away, give cortisone. But it switches off everything else too. It switches off the light. So the patient feels better and thinks he's better. The doctor feels great because the patient's out the door, but he hasn't changed anything. In acute situations, when it's life and death, of course you do it, but not to make a situation go away. It doesn't make a situation go away. So here's another graphic. It just shows you everything that vitamin D does. It stops cancer cell progression, okay? This is another um, graphic that I put together. The two ancient immune system, the Th1 system is the old innate immune system. So the day you're born, you've got this immune system. It's killer cells. It's the cell part of it. It's cell mediated. And the Th2 system develops over you. The Th2, you could remember the first two years of your life. It'll develop then. You get a bit of milk from your mom and the rest, your body makes starts making its own antibodies and this is antibodies th1 is cells th2 is antibodies th70 ramps up your immune system it drives it crazy you'll have that with allergies with autoimmune disease okay and then you've got interleukin 17 is a is an interleukin chemokine that drives inflammation and that is completely out of out of control in these pathological inflammation. And then you want to use interleukin 10, which calms down. And you, you get T regulatory cells, and T regulatory cells are like the, you know, like the referee in a rugby game. He says, guys, hang on, calm down. It doesn't switch it off, but it modulates it. So vitamin D is a massive T17 uh, T regulator. So these are the articles. You can go through them bit by bit. You will have, as I say, if you want them, you can mail me in the end and we will send it to you. I've taken some relevant uh, vitamin D info as relevant to cancers and tumor. <clears throat> it changes tumor environment and it, it basically optimizes. Low dose naltrexine, LDN, is an old drug. It was used for drug addicts. It doesn't work well for drug addicts. And they used 50 milligrams a day. We don't use it at 50 milligrams a day. We use it at one to five, maximum five milligrams a day. What does it do? It changes your endorphins in your brain. So when you've got a runner that runs every day and he cannot go a day without running, they produce endorphins. It's like a protective mechanism in your body. It calms down pain. It switches your immune system into an optimal stage. And it makes you feel good. It's a morphine type substance. So LDN blocks your brain for six hours on feeling that endorphin. So your brain thinks at night, I must make more. So when you wake up in the morning, you've got a high level of endorphins and they influence your immune system. I've given you all the resources. They're here. They're interactive. If you get the PDF, these links will be active. You can just click on it. It'll take you to the website. Okay. All right. Here we are. Low doses. Administrate. Every day, and this stuff has to be taken every day. And remember, this is a drug. This is a conventional drug. So it's not something funny, plant, plant-like. But it works. And it's got a very potent anti-cancer effect. In many, many cancer clinics, use this default. When the patients walk in and they put them on certain protocols, and it shows you how these mechanisms work. Lithium. 
Lithium salts have been used in psychiatry for many, many years, but they use them at high doses. They use them at 500 to 1,000 milligrams. It's like an antidepressant type of stuff. It changes the brain function and then acts. What's been found out that lithium in low dose, look at my top, I only use, I want to use two milligrams, maximum 10 milligrams of lithium orotate monohydrate. And these are just the formulations, okay? So you use a tiny, tiny, tiny trace amount. It protects your brain. It keeps your hippocampus in your brain, hippocampus, which is the structure that connects all your memories. Lithium in a small dose is one of the most neuroprotective, brain protective thing that we can use. And if you look at it, anti-cancer. Inhibition of tumor growth, regulating tumor, tumor invasion, and then it. That's all the stuff we want to look at this. It reduces cell growth, it inhibits metastasis, it causes cell cycle arrest, the cells cannot replicate anymore. It stops migration, it inhibits proliferation, it induces cell death, it decreases tumorogenicity, in other words, it makes the tumor less aggressive, and it starts autophagy, in other words, it creates the tumor to kill itself, okay? It starts apoptosis in your tumor cells. Is there any drug that can do that? This is what the guys are trying to research. If they had a drug like that, it would be the number one drug. Different, different cycles, I've given you ref the references. Neuroprotective role, when they are in their chemo and when they do their other treatments, you should give them lithium because it protects their brain, because the brain also takes a hemorrhage. You know, these chemi uh, chemical substances are really very, very aggressive. And it has an effect on all these different cancers. You can see that breast cancer, cervical cancer, and lung cancer are the big ones. Mm -hmm. And it's just a graph that I got from an article. The articles are always on top. Methylene blue, can you believe it? That's the stuff that makes your gene blue. It's ancient. It comes from, eight, I think it was developed 18... 1876, in the dye industry, in the, in the commercial dyes. And they discovered it can do all sorts of things. It was used against malaria. It was used as an antibiotic. And the great thing is it goes straight to your mitochondria and it goes straight to your brain and it bypasses all these, you could say, all these molecules, these complexes, as if I want to start a car with jumper leads. So my own battery is flat, the mitochondria don't work anymore. So methylene blue puts a cable on complex one and he puts it on the cable complex four. So that's why it boosts your mitochondria and therefore it's neuroprotective, it boosts your brain, it boosts your cognitive stuff, it's anti-cancer and this is why I pulled it out here. Why is it anti-cancer? Why do you think? Because it helps mitochondria. You now know why it works for cancer. Anything that helps mitochondria will be anti-cancer. In cancer cells, there are certain proteins, and when you can change them and influence them, you will stop cancer cells. And they've taken a cancer drug here, Novobioxin, and they've compared it to methylene blue, and guess what? They did just as well, and it costs peanuts. So here we have it against prostate cancer. It uses apoptosis. In other words, cancer cells and prostate cancer get told to die by methylene blue. That's what it says. This is a slide from the long COVID protocol. And what I've done here is when you put methylene blue in, it inhibits the spike protein by 80%. Okay, So it takes it out of circulation. So remember, when you are long COVID, and we've all had been in contact with COVID, we don't want spike protein. So if you use methylene blue, you might get a double benefit because it might take out whatever spike protein is or influence it or help it. And also it might help, you know, your cancer situation. Interesting, methylene blue was used to make blood products in HIV positive patients usable for other people. So they mixed it with methylene blue, they irradiated it with UV light, and then they used HIV positive blood for normal people. It deactivated the virus. Crazy stuff. That was done 30 years ago. And now people don't know about it. Okay. It displays a virucidal, preventive, or therapeutic activity against H1A1, that's a, a swine virus, 
and uh, SARS-CoV-2. Okay. Selenium, major player. There's a reference. You need tiny, tiny amounts. 500 micrograms per day is enough. High dosing, 5,000 micrograms. You can use with chemotherapy. We won't do that. That's left for the oncologist if they want to do that. If you look at the topic, novel anti-cancer agents, they always write potential, even if they've got a fancy drug, because they don't want to be told your stuff doesn't work. So they always write that. And these are some graphs that are really interesting. It stabilizes your DNA, and it does everything you want to do. It induces apoptosis, improves your immune system, it reduces inflammation. Cell cycle arrest means your cells, your cancer cells, can't can't replicate anymore. It blocks the in, it blocks the um, blood vessels going into tumors. Another article, there are many, many, many. Another graph, great stuff. Makes cancer cells die. It changes gene expression. It stops angiogenesis. It's cell cycle arrest. It stops tumor cell migration. Every single thing we want, once we've had our chemo and once we've done what we've done, and what do we want now? Okay, so once again, lifestyle, ketogenic diet, and then we put these things on top. I'm just going to leave this up a couple of seconds so that the video is recorded like this. Another one, fascinating. It's good for your heart, anti-cancer, it's good for your brain, it's good for your thyroid, good for your immune system, for your bones, fertility, intestines, IBS, IBD. Incredible, simple trace element. Taurine is an amino acid. Comes used to be uh, extracted from ox bile, that's why I called it. And basically, it's manufactured differently today. And I thought, what is this stuff? And remember, I searched for anti cancer effects, so it came up apoptosis in prostate cancer. Crazy stuff. How it influences the cell cycles in the cell, influences mitochondria. Another one. When you have chemotherapy, it attenuates, it weakens the adversary, it makes them easier to bear. So it helps with side effects. Antioxidant capacity, but it's got a lot more like that. Here we are again, mitochondrial function. And I think today's talk is unique in a way that we combine the mitochondrial aspect with all the rest of it. We pull it all together. I don't know of anybody that has combined it in that way. And it's just fascinating if you spend so much time on this stuff, and I've virtually spent thousands of hours over my lifetime, you get a big picture, and it's amazing. It helps you a lot. I don't have the detail. I'm not a specialist. I don't need to. If I want detail, I go and dig into it, and I get an idea, but then I go back and I have my helicopter view. Another one, these are the mechanisms. Primary goes to transformation. And then if you don't do anything, you've got metastasis. If you add taurine, this is what they say. It has, it changes the environment of the tumor. It stops new vessel formation. It activates the immune system against the tumor and it stops tumor progression. And it uses these mechanisms. CDS, chlorine dioxide is an old thing. It's the same stuff that you use in your water purification pills when you go hiking. So remember, you go and hike the fish river, you, you get some water, it's full of tadpoles and frogs that you need to drink. You take a handkerchief, you pour it through there, and then you throw a, a chlorine dioxide pill in it, you leave it for 10 minutes, you can drink it. And it kills all the bacteria, all the viruses. It's effective against all sorts of viruses. It has been shown to be effective against COVID and, and, and the most important part, it provides a lot of oxygen. It's an oxidative therapy. And this is why we use it. This stuff gets supplied to us from a lab that makes it industrially. So I know it's at 2000 ppm parts per million. You dilute 25 milliliters into a liter and you rinse your mouth and you do whatever you want to do. And like the water purification pill, you can drink it. Where do we also use it? In our dental chips. We buy little pills and put them in a water bottle. They clean the water lines, these little pipes, and prevent that bacteria can grow there. So we drink it. It's fine. It dissociates into CO2, into O2 and water. So what did they do? 
Hang on, let's go one step back. If you ever go into the FDA site, you will see this thing. You will see a warning. And they will say it's bleach. Chemically, it's not bleach. But listen to the story. Despite warning, people are still being less led and claim that it's effective in COVID. Maybe they want to um, protect the public. I don't know what the story behind it is. You can make up your own mind. Okay. It gets used widely in food industry. There are some municipalities that use it to clean their municipal water. So if you can use it for municipal water, surely I can drink it as well. This is my farmer logic. Okay. Let's leave it at that. Anyway, these are some cases. They used it, and there's a South American group which has basically gone, and what they do is they take some blood, they, in, they mix it with um, CDS, and they re-inject it, and they've got incredible, um, they've got incredible results. Some of my doctor friends would say, yeah, but this is not science, this is not a double blind, thing, thing, thing. it's okay. Medicine evolved up to, say, 100 years ago without double blind placebo control clinical trials. We learn from each other. Sometimes things went wrong, but in generally, everything improved over time. Okay. So it says activated leukocytes release reactive oxygen species, which kill cancer cells. So what does it mean? It provides a massive amount of oxygen. Other clinics like Dr. Merrick, they will push the press protocol and they will put patients in a hyperbaric chamber, which is a high oxygen chamber. I've got a formal plan. I give the patient this one. as a simple effect, and it costs. So, orally ingested into free radicals as found in neutrophils. Neutrophils are immune cells that go around the pathogen, and they've got a little bubble with lysosome, and they've got a little bubble with um, hydrogen peroxide or hyperoxide, and they let it go onto the bug, and it takes the bug out, shoot, it kills the bugs. It's the same thing. It's using nature at its core. So they treated breast cancer, kidney, prostate, all the cancers. And they had a small group. I think it was only 14 people or something like that. Lasting tumor response with a combination of oral enema and intra. Okay, they, get it, they, they had them drink it. They gave it to an enema. Why? Because if you give an enema, it goes whoop, straight into your body. It goes from your colon to your liver, which is great because from the liver, it does what it does in the liver, and then it gets spread to the body. So it's like highly oxygenating stuff. The, the takeaway from this one is CDS killed the house, uh, killed cancer cells and left the healthy cells alone. So let's get to one of the big guys that there's been a lot of talk about it. The articles are there. It has at the bottom, interestingly, it can also inhibit tumor stem cells. Those are the tough ones. Remember, the chemo can't kill tumor stem cells. Other making can when used in combination. So this is not what I say. This is what's out there and what you can find. In fact, Paul Merrick also has it on his list. Why did I use ivermectin? Because so far as I know, it doesn't do anything to the mitochondria. So it's on my list. In vitro means in a petri dish, and in vivo means in a body activities. So it's cool. Why not use it? Lactoferrin. What's lactoferrin? It's a type of protein with a bit of iron bound to it, which comes from bovine milk, from cow's milk. They isolate it and they purify it, and you can buy it as a supplement. And if you stick it in your mouth and you use it at 750 or 1,000 milligrams a day, it's got an incredible range of anti cancer effect and things that it does. It inhibits proliferation, it stops going, cancer cells going to other places, and so on. And there are many, many articles there out there. So I've given you a few. You can, at home, if you see this video, you can look at it, go through it bit by bit. Colorectal cancer, can you imagine? Berberine extract from fruit. I put their champion in my silly little tag there. If you get, say, a thousand milligram a day, and this is one of our cycles. We're going to go one month berberine, one month ivermectin, one month. So club it every month with a different. Berberine is incredible because it changes your glucose metabolism. And remember, the glucose metabolism 
it stops glucose getting into the cell. And also, it's good for diabetes. They use it for diabetes. But because diabetes, mitochondria, and glucose metabolism are all connected, this thing has, I believe, therapeutic effect has been reported. Colon, breast, pancreatic, liver, oral cancer, bone, cutaneous, prostate, and stuff. These are the markers. What does it do? It enters the cell here at the top, and then it blocks inhibition of growth factor. Cell signaling pathways, it blocks them. So the cells can't grow anymore, and they start doing apoptosis. It can't, the cancer cells can't go into the blood vessels anymore. They can't replicate anymore, and they can't divide it. And cancer cell signaling pathways, we've got another graph. And this is where it gets interesting. Remember, mTOR is a pro-inflammatory target. It, in, it scavenges free radicals. In other words, the black smoke from the land cruiser, it picks it up. It starts apoptosis, it stops cell, cancer cells from replicating. It stops blood vessels from getting into the tumor, calms down inflammation, and it changes this pathway. Okay, And this pathway will influence cancer signal. Another one, all the different cycles. This is an interesting one. NF NRF2 is a pathway which switches on survival mechanisms in your body. It makes you tougher, it makes you recoup easier, and so on. Next one, this veritrol comes from grapes. So you can say, yes, um, I have to drink a lot of red wine. <laughs> um, you need about five liters of red wine to get the same, same as one capsule of this stuff. So this is also one of the cyclical substances. So here we are, anti-cancer, and I like this one, a focus on its impact on mitochondrial functions. That's where we are working, on the mitochondria. Pleiotrophic anti-cancer effects means a wide ranging, it works in many different places, not just the one. Most cancer drugs work in one place. And I've shown you this huge thing of mechanisms if you only tackle one, the cancer has got 20 others to go around. It's like the internet. So these funny, these plant substances, I presume because they've been around for billions of years, and remember that baobab tree. That baobab tree has to fight every elephant, every monkey, every human, every bird, every insect, and every bacteria and every virus. I'm sure he's developed mechanisms to keep them off his back. And those are the substances we as humans can use. So this is the one where we can see all the different mechanisms where it works. And at the end, what does it do? It induces apoptosis, killing cancer cells. Look here, it prevents metastasis. Isn't that what we, it limits new blood vessels. It targets cancer stem cells. Those are the ones that we want to plug because they will stay behind. They are still there, although you cannot see them. So we want to get, we want to, get to them. The ability of reservoir to regulate cellular interfere with mitochondrial functions in cancer cells. We want to mess up mitochondria and cancer cells. If they die in cancer cells, then the cancer cell will die. This is a picture of what happens inside tumor mitochondria. They've aerobic glycolysis. They have got oxygen, but they don't use it. They use fermentation. We want to change that. They cannot use lipid metabolism. That's good. So we can, we can use it. Healthy cells can use um, lipid metabolism. They've got an acidic environment. Um, they're hyperpolarized, and they've got a lot of reactive oxygen, and they are suppressed in apoptosis. So we, we want to boost all those things again, and this is what happens with, with resveratrol. So another one from another article. The article's at the top. PubMed, scientific articles, all the things you want in a substance are for you are here. When you see a lot of yellow, I got very excited, okay, because then I thought this and this and this. I'm going to not read all through, through all this stuff, but it, it basically reinforces what we've spoken about this morning. This is a bit more sophisticated. At the top, you see glucose, resveratrol blocks the glucose getting into the nucleus. So if it stops getting it into the cell, it stops it getting into the mitochondria, and then <clears throat> the mitochondria can't work that well. So the bottom line is stop cell growth, stops uh, invasion, and it stops 
proliferation. Curcumin is an old anti-cancer uh, a traditional medicine substance. Many, many articles, fascinating stuff. The problem with curcumin is it's not that easy to get it into the body. But if you look at the mechanism, it stops tumor cells replicating, it stops them sh spreading, it stops them being sensitive to chemotherapy. Um, so if you give chemotherapy with curcumin, chemotherapy works better. Um, it causes them to to apoptose, in other words, to die, and it's got a whole lot of other things at work. So I'm going to jump through this, go through it more and more. <clears throat> this is the dream world. We want to eliminate all tumor cells, okay? This is the real world. We All we want to do is we want to keep the tumor cells that each one of us has, we want to keep them in check, and then we can live happy after, okay? And this is when the tumor goes haywire. Now, we don't want to go there. Okay? And this is what this whole program about is about. So with ever, whatever happened, some of us have never been in this place. Some of us have had treatment, so we are in this place. But they call it in remission. This is the middle one. And we don't want it to go into escape. Okay? And this is why, we, why we're speaking about what we do. Different mechanisms. This is still curcumin. You can read it in your own time. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, great stuff. Anti-inflammatory, all the different things, different pathway stops. In other words, if you look at the bottom line, it does everything to stop cancer cells for them to be successful. This is quite an interesting, it's actually a very, very comprehensive one. I think only really scientists who spend a lot of time with us will go through this, but it's a lovely graphic. Once again, if now you develop a, a drug, maybe you develop a drug that could block this enzyme or this protein, okay? All of a sudden, the cancer will have many other ways to get to where it is, okay? So this curcumin works wherever there's a Q, uh, CUR, there, there, uh, there's one, there's one. And whenever you see this one, it says it blocks it. So these ATK MDM2 block P53. And P53 is a cancer protection gene. Okay. And if that thing gets blocked, then the cancer can let it get away. But if it's not blocked, then it can control the cancer. So it does it in a back to front way. Quercetin is also a plant extract. Quite a few articles. Makes your blood thin. I use it for long code. Makes your blood thin. It's a, um, <clears throat> a zinc ionophore. It brings zinc into the cell. If the zinc is in the cell, viruses cannot replicate. Anti-cancer, cytotoxic impact on ovarian cancer. Nice graphic with all the mechanisms. The articles at the top. Once again, question. What's interesting always, very often when they talk about um, research in, with plant-based substances, they always refer back to the bioenergetics mitochondrial function. And it makes sense because that's where it all starts. And any plant stuff that can go back to the basics will have an effect on chronic disease and cancer. If you look at the different cancers and what it does there, look here, osteosarcoma, we're in cancer, colon, oral, breast cancer, leukemias even, lung cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And these, it's actually a very nice graphic, this one. So you go in with quercetin, say, for one month, and you come out, and then you put ivermectin, for instance, in, or you put resveratrol in, or you put something else. Eusolic acid, also plant extract. Let me just go once again. Strangely enough, works via mitochondria. And this is why, why I've put it in here. I want to build up the mitochondria for long COVID, and I want to build up the mitochondria because it will help the cancer story. Okay? It will help the immune system, and it will help the whole story behind that. Beneficial effects, lung cancer. This is where it gets come from, gets extracted from these plant products. Vivo animal studies mean loving animal studies show potent anti-effects of 
eusolic acid and indicate the need for clinical studies. Now, why do they put that in there? Let me go back. Now, let's go to the next one. Black seed is black cumin, um, black seed oil. You can buy it the health shops. You can buy it in capsules. It's an ancient traditional part of medicine. It's used in food, and then they looked at the anti-cancer properties, and there's a whole lot that come out. And when one reads these articles, one always has to look at who did the research, what are they trying to show, are they trying to show that it works, or are they trying to show that it doesn't work? Because, you know, obviously there's a competition between other stuff and these things. If everybody starts using this and they find benefit, they might not buy other stuff, okay? Okay, this is exactly what we want. Crazy mechanisms, simple plant extract, black cumin. In the pharmaceutical industry, what often happens is that you take drugs, anti-cancer drugs, well, actually, they were originally plant products, and they, they purified them and changed them a bit, and they patented them as anti-cancer drugs. And today, we've basically got, and this comes from a German doctor, We've got 10 basic anti-cancer drugs. When the one doesn't work anymore, they combine it with another one. At the moment, there's very, very little new development because they've virtually done everything they can do as to cytotoxic cancerous drugs. So they just mix them in different packages. And then it gets sold as a new mixture and a new invention. And they become more and more and more expensive. Okay. And look, I'll talk about the figures just now, but that is just the basic process. Green tea extract, it's a crazy long name. So it's a crazy name, but it's basically green tea extract. So you get it, you get a couple of milligrams when you drink a cup of green tea, about 50 to 80 milligrams, it's not a lot. You would have to drink about 10 cups of green tea a day, which we don't want. Some of them have got caffeine and so it will make you very high. But so you get it in an extract, it's got a crazy, crazy, crazy anti-cancer effect uh, um, activities. Once again, <clears throat> all the mechanisms, inhibition of inflammation and oncogenesis, inhibition of oncogenesis. So plant extracts do the same. Why do I think this stuff works? Do you think plants get cancer? Of course they get cancer. And therefore plants have developed stuff over millions of years that helps them to organize this. And this is why we find this stuff in plants. And then you jump back to the old traditional medicines. They didn't have these graphs, they didn't have the science, but they realized over many years, the wisdom that they had, that if you drink that stuff, then you feel better or something happens. And they did it again and again and again. And this is human interaction. Bromelain. It, it's an extract from, it's actually an enzyme, it's a proteolytic enzyme that comes from a pineapple stem. Now, this is one of quite uh, of the strong substances. So, bromelain are used for long COVID, but it's also active in anti cancer. Okay. I think it has got an effect on the cancer environment. You can see here what it all does. We use it for wound repair, it works against viruses, against bugs, incredible stuff. And it makes your blood thinner, which is also something we want. And many types of cancer at the bottom. Artemisium, Artemisia anua, an old tropical herb. Um, it grows all over the world in the, you could say, the uh, tropical areas. It even grows in Namibia. Zimbabwe, further north, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, I use it a lot. Interesting, it's an anti-malaria drug. It has got a lot of anti-cancer effects and it's also got some antibiotic effects and it's the closest natural thing to ivermectin. So if you can't get ivermectin and you want to do something similar to ivermectin action, you can use this stuff. Listen, look at this topic, really fascinating stuff. Have an excellent safety and tolerability profile as well as being affordable for the low and middle class income countries around one, S, one US dollars per day. It's 10 Namibia dollars, no, 20 Namibia dollars. That's really affordable, okay? 
And they say robust, well-designed clinical trials of Artemis drug are indicated for a variety of different cancers. And you will see it in other substance. I will say, why don't you just leave the thing as it is? Why do you now want to make it into a drug? All the different mechanisms. And this is a little bit about how they extracted it. Now that's okay. Niacinamide is niacin, which is vitamin B3. And niacinamide, fascinating enough, this article I got recently this year, I think from Makola, and I followed up on this stuff, and I found quite a lot. And it has got quite a potent role in anti-cancer activity. And you can see there, in the movie, we've had a craze of NAD products, remember? You know, they were shipped around and everybody took them. And I looked at them and I said, ah, uh, they've got so many substances in one little capsule. And we know that we, when I compound my stuff, I know I can only get about 700 milligrams into a big capsule. So how will you fit all that stuff? Obviously, they use, they use tiny amounts in it, but the patients mostly, 99%, come back and say, I feel so much better, it's doing me good. And this basically gave me another support because it works inside the mitochondria. It's one of the big molecules that is involved in the electron transfer chain, the, re the redox molecules. It picks up electrons and it passes down electrons. So this is why it's so important. So this stuff is pro-mitochondrial health, and you will add it onto that, vitamin B3. Okay, and in some articles it's called uh, niacinamide or nicotinic acid. They all much of the same. Nicotinum, nicotinamide and niacinamide are the same thing. Okay, I especially went and looked it up because I realized one article says this, the other one says that. Cancer prevention, there you have it, very very simple graphic, that's all you need to know. It works against secondary cancer, it links that, that, that. Again, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and, 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 and the different, when you have a little bar there, it says blocking it. So in other words, um, it blocks DNA repair in breast cancer cells, that's what you want, they want to die, and it stops, it activates cell cycle arrest, so it prevents breast cancer cells from replicating. It stops metastasis, uh, it stops invasion, and it stops proliferation. That's what you want. Here you have it, lymphomas, interesting stuff, the mechanisms that they use, hyperacin, St. John's wort. Okay, it's another plant extract. Fascinating. 100 three articles met the established inclusion. So this is a review. They took 100, over 100 articles and looked at them all. And they, they threw out the ones where they thought the stuff wasn't written well or whatever. So they only took, say, 100. Hyperinous shine, anti-cancer against tup, tup, tup. Breast, cervical, colorectal, tup, that whole lot. Surely that's good enough for me to use it for one month or whatever we want as an add-on, okay? There you've got all the cancers, which is St. John's Wort. Old stuff, old, old stuff. And then again, at the bottom of the article, considering that hyperin so sh showed to be cytotoxic that's against cancer, it seems to be a keno preventive agent and a good candidate for any plastic drug development. So what do they say? They say, this thing is amazing. Let's use it and make a drug out of it. And then you get sold it again in the pharmacy. Now you buy it in the health shop or whatever. Okay, so another nice graphic. I love graphics because you sit at them and you say, oh, this goes there, this goes there. Interesting, at the bottom here, it says apoptosis. Great, that's what we want. I want the cancer cell to die. St. John's Ward, another one. And now we come to Jackie, Brownie. Jackie's a biokineticist. She's a person in Namibia that is selling grounding products. In other words, grounding mats, sheets, and, 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 and it is an I've had one, not from Jackie, but from the internet. I think I bought it, what? 
tien jaar, acht jaar terug. Long time ago, we sleep on it every night. You can take it and have, it's got a little, it's, it's a sheet with normally silver uh, fiber uh, wire, wires in it, very thin. So it connects your body to electrical thing. And then there's a plug or the cable. You can plug it into the plug, into the black or into the main plug. We didn't do that. We have a special cable that goes out the bedroom and we've got a lemon tree outside and there's a copper pen on the ground. So it goes into the ground. So our bodies are electrically connected to the earth the whole night. This stuff is really amazing. And this is why <coughs> Jackie sells this stuff here. Her website's right at the bottom here, Browning Africa. All the products are there, very nicely made up. Thanks. Well done. If you've got any injury, if you want to recover, uh, the Tour de France. The guys developed earthing sleeping bags. So at one stage, the American team, when they came off their bikes at night, they went into the sleeping bag, which was earthed. They regenerated twice as fast as the other teams. Okay. So there was a discussion, is it, is it doping or is it not doping? Now we've got other instruments that make very strong magnetic fields, dynamic or static magnetic fields. So all I'm saying is these wild and woolly technologies today also have a place as an adjunct to other stuff. Okay. So if you are in a chronic disease state, if you are in a cancer recovery state or whatever, or even just you want to be healthy, you sleep better, your jet lag, your anything, it calms down inflammation. Why? We've talked the whole morning about reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are molecules that have got too few electrons. Now you can give them electrons by antioxidants. Antioxidants are electron donors. They give electrons. They have electrons to give. But the biggest electron donor is the Earth. Every bolt of lightning from the ionosphere that hits the Earth out of the clouds provides billions and billions and trillions of, of electrons. They spread over the earth and the moment you touch the, the soil, you can pick them up and they will neutralize your free radicals. That's why they are dampening inflammation. If you look at blood, I've got a picture of the blood here on the left and around every red blood cell, there should be lots of electrons. It's like when you when we were at school, we got a little glass rod and a rabbit skin and we rub it and eventually our hair would stand up and you touch your neighbor and it would cluck. The, the spark would jump over. So you had so many electrons that it would jump onto the next guy that didn't have a lot. If you do not have, and the electrons push each other away like when your hair stands up. So this is what it does to the blood cells. It's got zeta potential. It's a negative charge. If you have not got enough, if you are in a Re, um, reactive oxygen stress, then you don't have enough electrons and the blood cells will start lumping together and then you will get rollo formation. They, they stick together. And then your blood looks like this. And please notice this is a video. You can see the little goodies at the bottom here zooming around. The blood does not move. You can imagine what happens to your body in this, in this situation. So then you can put it on an earthing mat. And what happens then? Then the blood cells look like this. And now they can move past each other. Okay. They've got enough electrons <clears throat> to change this thing. So in COVID, earthing was very valuable. There were some incredible, you can't say experiments even. They took some people in ICU and they earthed them. And they, they looked at what was happening. And they found really beneficial outcomes. In, if you look at a treatment or an intervention, I would always say, look at two things. What's the upside and what's the downside? In a case like this, the upside is anything we love, zero. The downside is zero. And this is something that we have to go back to. Okay. So here we are. This is Grounding Africa. Thanks, Jackie. Nice website. You've got some pictures. There is massive and masses of research. And stuff like that will also be in the coaching program. So we will teach people that. We will show you what it does. 
where you get resources. Simple thing. If you at home, if you if you're comfortable with it, take your shoes off, walk on the lawn bed, go and walk on the beach, lie on the wet beach, sleep on a grounding mat. Computer wise, you can get grounding mats for your laptop. Put it on a grounding mat, put your arms on it, take your shoes off, put your feet on a grounding mat. There is endless possibilities. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, today here and also online, thank you so far. We're going to come to the final part, which is really the practical part. What I've done, I've gone to a couple of cancer, <clears throat> I call it cancer friends. They've been through this. I looked at their treatments. Some of them were reasonable, and reasonable would be in the million dollars, 360,000 roughly around there for a treatment that lasted about six months. Okay. The second one was a patient over many years, and he passed away during the COVID time. But in that time, for two or three years, <clears throat> we supported him. And he was on specific chronic cancer medication, and that cost him $90,000 a month. So that came to just over a million a year. And if we look at the reality of that, there are few people in Namibia in this country. In fact, I don't think even 10%, maybe 5%, they can afford it. And then the other cases are simpler cases, um, cancer treatment average, about 1.3 million per year. And then I've, got, I've picked out a fourth case. These were three cases here. So the average of those three cases, and those were random cases. Now, obviously, these costs vary. And I assume often that the oncologist doesn't see the big picture. He doesn't see it all because cancer treatments are split up amongst various um, places and various professions and so on. But the average that I got was for the overall payments, and that was over 800,000 Namibia dollars per annum. So I want you to keep that number in mind. Um, the fourth case is a younger patient. He's, he's in his middle 30s or early 30s. Um, he went through four months of chemo. Part of it was done in an oncology center. So the chemo was just under a million. In that time, there were all some ICU stays because after the chemo, he was uh, he was really in a bad shape. So the ICU, um, I think it was two weeks. Yeah, that was just you could say a quarter million. And then you had the adults, and they came to another two million. Then after that, um, it was suggested that they go to stem cell cell therapy. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure what was suggested. I'm just talking about the potential price that was, would have been added onto that. I don't think the patient did it because um, his family then got involved and they, they moved him onto a support program, which was guided by an integrative oncologist, as he called him, and they, they had lots of knowledge an initiative to help the person himself. So that was another 110 or 120,000, but I don't think they did the stem cells. So the stem cells, if we add it all together, and that I include the stem cells, it would have been six and a half million. So my question is, is there not another way? And I believe there is, okay? I've shown you another way, and I think we need to look at the optimal maximum upside and we want us to limit my downside. So I've gone along and I've said to you, we want to provide you stuff that is safe, that is affordable and has got potential upside. I can't tell you how much upside, but I can pretty much tell you there will be virtually no downside. Okay. And any little business model needs three legs. So in my world, this is what I've done for 35 years now. I want to have my heart in it. I want to enjoy it. It has to create value. And at the end, there has to be some money left over. There has to be a profit. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. And if we talk about an Namibian cancer protocol or support program, 
I believe these are sound principles to run. So I worked out a scheme. If we do support for, for people every month, that includes teaching initially, that gets them on the road, that is the supplement protocols, and it will be done for less than 100,000. In fact, it will probably be less than 60,000 in years. Compare that to 800,000. It's not chalk and cheese, okay? And I really believe it should be anybody that really wants to help cancer friends, cancer veterans, as I call them, to make a decision and say, listen, let's become involved, let's roll this out to more people, and let's see what comes of it. So, once again, the top is the professions and the science. This is what I've been involved so far. We've set up the second layer with coaching, as I say, Elise and Rosal Ros uh, in this case. So we will develop it further. We will carry on from there. And this is where I would like to get feedback from you, where you want to be involved, if you want to be involved. And then at the bottom, call them cancer friends, call them cancer veterans. I think it's a better word because you've been through it, you've experienced it, and it's more neutral. You're not a survivor. Because if you talk about life and death, we all in life and death situations. The real story is your quality of life. What can we do to have a great quality of life? So this is much the end of my talk today.